Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm today moderator Jasley from InfoTrack, and together with me today is Mr. Sean Law. Here, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's free webinar on adopting AI in organization. So this three-hour training session will provide a comprehensive guide for organizations that are looking to adopt and also integrate the AI into your operations. So covering uh, essential aspects from understanding AI to creating a strategy, managing, Sorry, some technical error. So um, to creating a strategy management, uh, managing the organization change and also ensuring continuous improvement. So this course will, I believe, it will equip you with uh, lots of the knowledge and tools that need to success to implement the AI technology in your organization. So I think without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker today, Mr. Sean. Are you ready? Mr. Sean? Yes, good morning. Hi, hi, Jocelyn. Good morning. Good, good morning, morning, everyone. Yeah, okay. So I'll pass the floor to you. Sure. Thank you. So I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now, and I hope everyone can, can see my screen. And uh, if you can see my screen, it's basically the title page called Adopting AI in Organizations. Once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, three hour session where we will talk about how, as an organization, we can adopt. Uh, AI in a more structured manner. And I know AI is a very exciting topic, right? Uh, and sometimes, right, in uh, <clears throat> when we talk about exciting topics, right, and, uh, and when organizations want to implement AI, we always have this problem trying to do something or implement something without some sort of uh, structure to, to sustain it, yeah? And the whole focus on these three hours is to actually talk about uh, how we can structurally do this, and then how we can apply some sort of a uh, AI, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, implementation framework uh, to to do that. Yeah. So once again, my name is Sean. Right. I come from an organization called Mind Imagine, and we are an, a consulting and training organization that focuses on helping organizations to be able to implement some of these new, uh, new way of working right uh we in our organization we do uh, agile agile coaching we actually help organizations to set up uh structures uh, strategies for implementation to enable your organization to be more what you call that uh, more effective and more efficient okay um so i just want to put up some uh what could that some basic what well, I call the housekeeping uh, information out there first. So if you do have any questions, please actually put it up on the Q&A section. You can find that button uh, right on top next to the chat button. So, and um, I, will, my, I might not be able to answer all the questions immediately, but uh, I, we will definitely help you uh, maybe even after today's session. Uh, the focus on today's session is not too much on the... Uh, technical aspect of it because again uh the technical aspect of ai that is an, another whole huge topic that uh, we will need to explore further right and it's always difficult to recommend certain uh, technical tools or infrastructure unless we are able to understand your organization uh, more, much more deeper and and uh, we will be able to help you with that by giving you information to contact us at the end of the uh, session okay so do ask your question. Um, and I always like to tell people there's no such thing as a simple question. We are all in this journey of trying to do things correctly and implement this effectively. Okay, um, right. So I will start with a little introduction. My name is Sean uh, Lau and I've been with the, uh, I've been working in the industry for more than 30 years. Some people say, what industry? Well, I've been working in IT service management, organizational change, operational efficiency uh, for a long time. And I actually have experience in many different types of organizations and, and industry as well. In fact, uh, early in my career, I started out working in advertising and then spending 12 years working with a business newspaper in Malaysia and then moving on to uh, 
service providers, uh, spending four years working in a non-profit organization, implementing processes, doing consultancy. So pretty much have a very diverse work experience. I've also contributed in helping organizations of these different industries like telecommunications, uh, manufacturing, finance, uh, in actually applying this. Okay, uh, I'm also certified in uh, uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence, though I sometimes, uh, I'm very careful to use the word expert. I think to say someone is an expert uh, means that the person knows everything, which is not true. I, like you, uh, am learning through this journey because AI is still very, very new. I, I say very new is because the adoption of AI uh, is still very, very new. We, we are just scratching the surface and we will see that later on, right? In fact, even, even the concepts of AI started in the 1950s uh, and even earlier than that. But again, the application of AI is just uh, coming up nowadays right and it's slowly being implemented so uh really happy to 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 be here uh to do this with you oh by the way yeah i did use ai to generate the the the, the little graphic on the left so um there's no point talking about ai unless i do use some ai within the the the, the discussions and the uh and the presentation okay i didn't mention much earlier that uh, I did spend about 12 years working in a business newspaper. And I want to start today by actually telling you a story. And I think this is a very important story. And I'll get to the point why I'll tell you, I'm telling you the story later. But basically, when I was working in the newspaper, what actually uh, interests me or excites me is by seeing how journalists and reporters uh, build up stories for the newspaper. In fact, if you look at a newspaper organization, it is very data-driven because you can't just report news that you don't have facts or data to, to support it. And in the newspaper, right, because data is coming in so much and so fast, and the journalists and reporters are trying to verify and validate, validate things, right, they had to do it in a very structured way. They can't just simply get all the information and then uh, unstructurally then look for evidence or look for data. So they had to structure it. For example, even planning interviews, they had to structure it. And, and when I was working in a newspaper, I love to see how they structured it, right? So that at the end of the day, they can pro produce a piece of news or piece of, piece of uh, reporting that is accurate, that is factual, right? And uh, that will help those readers in decision making. And, and through that learning, I, 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 I see that applies to everything we do. So the point I'm telling you this story is, if newspaper handling a lot of data, newspaper reporters handling a lot of data, has to structurally do it, and, and, and that structure is needed, how much more today we need to structurally implement AI? In fact, uh, the, 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 the amount of data that we use in helping us to uh, deliver good AI or, or, or implement good AI is so much more than a newspaper uh, can generate or the, the journalist can generate, right? And, and we are going to look at the structure of doing this. Yeah? Uh, it starts off uh, all the way at the beginning of developing a strategy and thinking about the, the, the what could that, the uh, processes, thinking about the organization itself. Right, and we will talk about that, and then I will give you some basic guidelines on how we can achieve that. Of course, like I said, uh, I can tell you the what needs to be done, how exactly it is to be done. Uh, that is something that we will need to you will we will need to work it out together. Like for example, if you need to you want to set something up, and you say that hey, I, I don't know how to set this up. I know what I need, but I don't know how this is done. Uh, I will give you some contact uh, numbers at the end of the session where you can reach out, and then we want to help you, help you to be successful in implementing this. Okay, so uh, that's a bit about myself. Let's begin. So let's start with the very basic of what is AI or uh, the actual word is actually artificial intelligence, okay? 
AI basically refers to the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. These actions can include problem solving, learning, and adapting to new information. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to read from the slides uh, throughout the session. I think uh, we will all fall asleep. But I just wanted to start to start. I want to start by actually describing AI as per what is actually uh, written. To summarize this, basically AI is able to simulate human intelligence. Right? Our, we humans, are, we are very intelligent because our brain is capable to capture a lot of data, to process it, and we can process it very quickly, and then apply it to solve problems, day-to-day -day problems or large problems. And, and the capability of our brain is that we are not solving problems, but we are learning right, as we go along and then adapting. So AI is basically mimicking what a human can do. Right. Uh, another explanation is that AI is a broad field of computer science that deals with creating intelligent agents, which are systems that can reason, learn, and act autonomously. So AI is not just being able to uh, sieve through data, right, uh, through, through machines and mimic human intelligence. AI can also even carry out the actions a human would carry out. So it kind of re uh, uh, is a complement, basically, all right? It complements uh, human abilities. So, and sometimes it can be even more efficient because depending on uh, how the AI is trained, uh, it tends to actually uh, make less mistakes. I, I will be very clear, AI can make mistakes, right? Because it all depends on the data they're collecting. If all the data that they have are data that is uh, incorrect and uh, we don't build algorithms or we don't build systems to actually clean it, AI can make mistakes, right? Don't, don't get me wrong. Like, for example, right, you most probably have heard of stories in the US where you no know, Uber, when they launched their autonomous driving cars, they actually made a mistake and there was a case where it actually uh, hit a person, right? And the reason, one reason why he hit the person was the person was not, because AI understands that uh, if it's a you know a crossing lane, you know the the white lines, the zebra crossing, they will stop and let the humans cross. But unfortunately, there was a a a, a person who actually jaywalked, crossed where they were not supposed to cross, and then the the car, the Uber car, couldn't actually reason because this is something of an outlier to them. Right? So again, uh, AIs do make mistakes if the data and the training is not correct. So someone asked me before, how do you determine if something is AI? Because nowadays we throw the word AI so loosely, or everything seems to be AI. But how do you determine if something is AI? So one of the tests, and I'm not saying that this is the only test because uh, this is very limited uh, as itself. So one of the tests we normally conduct to determine if something is AI is called the Turing test. The Turing test was actually developed by or introduced by uh, Alan Turing. That's why it's called the Turing test in the 1950. So if you don't know who Alan Turing is, he is a British computer scientist and mathematician. And one of his greatest achievements is actually to help break the Enigma code. Right, if you are a history buff, you will know that during uh, the World War, right, World War One, um, where the German used a special Enigma machine to sell send codes to other submarines, and uh, this code generating machine uh, or uh, uh, cipher was very difficult to to break, and Alan Turing and the team con uh, managed to break it and then translate what the German was saying, and that's how the the um, the, the wall uh, was shifted. So Alan Turing, a British mathematician and computer scientist, and if you want to find out about his achievement for the Enigma story, uh, there's a movie actually called The Imitation Game, uh, starring uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. This was many years ago. You can check that out. But Alan Turing says that uh, we need to be able to test if something is AI. Basically, the test uh, answer this very simple question. Can machines think? So how does this test, uh, how is this test conducted? The test is very simple. 
people. So in the test, you have a human uh, evaluator. So the human evaluator is basically person C. Human evaluator will send questions in text format to both a computer and another person. And when the answers come back, right, if the human evaluator cannot separate which is answered by computer and which is answered by human, that makes it AI. So that's the concept of, of, of proving if something is AI or not. So for example, nowadays you use tools like chat, uh, like, like chat GPT or, or Gemini or perplexity or whatever, right? Uh, the answers given to you should include how uh, a human would answer, right? And you sometimes can't tell the difference way or uh, by the way of how it thinks, how it answers, that should be considered something uh, uh, towards AI. But of course, the Turing test is very limited because uh, the Turing test uh, only looks at how the answers were, were, were delivered. And this was during the time where you ask text questions, right? Of course, nowadays, uh, AI has expanded where you can even send in photographs and pictures where the system can then evaluate it and then see if it's AI, uh, can, can answer or provide the answers like a human or not. Right, so we have the humans' uh, sentiment in place. Uh, all these things to be considered as well, but that's the basic thinking. If something's AI, so we hear a lot about AI. So are there different types of AI out there? Basically, there are yet three types. The first one is what we call narrow AI or weak AI, the the simplest form of AI. Basically. These are AI to perform specific tasks. For example, uh, virtual assistant, self-driving cars. So these are weak AI. That means like a self-driving car, it is actually designed to drive the car, bring a person safely to the destination, avoid accidents, and it's taught to do that. Right? And, and the, the data given to it is to do that alone. The second one is called general AI or also known as strong AI. Basically, this AI is capable to do more where it understands and learn uh, any intellectual task that a human can do. Basically, problem solving, learning from experience, uh, so and so. We have come to a point where there is another type known as super intelligence. And this is something that uh, I've been reading up on. And, and there is a book called Super Intelligence that if you are very interesting, interested in this, you should check it out. Basically, this is a hypothetical, but I don't see it anymore, uh, not too hypothetical anymore because uh, we are seeing it happening where the AI would surpass human intelligence in all aspects, including creativity, problem solving, and also social skills. Right, we we see a lot of these things coming up. For example, uh, AI can actually replace a lot of the things that a human can do. Uh, it is nothing to be afraid of, right? We 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 need to actually know this. But again, uh, of course, uh, we will talk about uh, what kind of rules that we need to set when these things happen. That's why in AI, we will talk about AI ethics later on. But there are different types of AI. And, and depending on your organization, where your organization uh, is looking at implementing AI, you could start with narrow AI, just task performance, robotics, uh, general AI in terms of uh, problem solving, and of course, maybe moving towards super intelligence. And, and there is no right and wrong in where to go to. Okay? So what are some of the key concepts of AI? So AI includes machine learning. Machine learning basically is to teach the machine, right? Either through supervised learning, that means we train the machine, or unsupervised learning, where the machine can actually, with the data, decides uh, to find clusters of uh, similar information and reinforce the learning, right? So machine learning is basically letting the machine learn so that uh, they can then provide the right answers. Now, machine learning, uh, is considered something that we, we use uh, quite often. We are now moving towards neural networks as well. And in neural networks, basically algorithms are built to even mimic the human's, human brain structure and functions. 
So rather than simplify algorithms to, to learn, right, it is built to mimic the human brain. Companies like uh, Google, uh, DeepMind, uh, uh, IBM, they already are moving towards neural, neural networks and neural computing. Yeah. Then we part of neural networks would be deep learning. So it is a combination of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks, right, to help solve complex, for example, chat box, virtual assistants, language translations, right, uh, sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis basically means understanding human emotion through the things they say. For example, uh, if I say I'm happy, right, they don't just capture the words happy and assume that I'm happy, they will also capi capture the intonation. Is Sean really happy when he says he's happy? Right? So that is deep learning. Natural language processing is to translate the way we say things or we speak right, into something that uh, will, will give uh, true meaning. For example, let's just say that uh, like in Malaysia, right? in Malaysia, we use a lot of uh, Malaysian nice English. So in natural language processing is that they can understand uh, our Malaysian nice English and then, or Malaysian nice uh, uh, language and then understand what we are saying. We do say a lot of laws and laws. <laughs> so, and that that uh, actually, we the word la itself has many intonations and how you say it has different meanings. And uh, AI should be able to read through that. Computer information is the ability to interpret. Computer vision is to interpret visual information rather than just text. By looking at surrounding, looking at maybe uh, visual information and pictures and things like that, then the AI can make sense of it and provide the right um, information back. Reinforced learning, type of machine learning, where an agent learns by interacting with the environment and, of course, by giving uh, by teaching it a reward system like rewarding the AI and punishing the AI, they can actually learn not to do certain things. One of the earliest version of reinforcement learning was something known as Deep Blue. Much earlier in the 1980s, uh, where IBM launched Deep Blue, where they play a chess match with the Grandmaster of Chess, where they learn, okay, if the chess master moved this, this, uh, uh, this chess piece, how would I react? So nowadays, of course, they, they have expanded this to not only chess, they actually use AI to even play a very popular uh, Asian game, uh, mainly played in Korea and Japan called Go. There is a machine called AlphaGo. Basically, Go is actually a game where you have uh, black and white kind of a, uh, buttons, right? And it is a very complicated game because it's more complicated than chess because there are many moves, many strategies you can apply. So AI can actually learn from how players play, how the opponents play, and then respond to it. Other concepts of AI is generative AI, and this is something that we use uh, very often, like uh, ChatGPT, Gemini. Generative AI refers to algorithms that can generate new data, such as image, text, music, even software code. This are uh, based on uh, pre-trained data, and of course, uh, based on the understanding of the pre-trained data, they can then deliver new information. For example, uh, if you don't know what GPT stands for, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So Chat GPT is Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer. It is partly trained, right? And through that training, the the AI can then build uh, more information and send more data. Robotics intersection between AI and engineering, where uh, systems and machine can perform tasks a, uh, a human can do. Uh, expert systems to help mimic decision making, for example, reasoning. Right, rule-based uh, approach to problem solving, like my medical diagnosis, financial decision-making tools, looking at market trends, you know, financial markets, and then deciding what to do. And of course, part of the national language processing, we have speech recognition. And this is just part of some of the AI concepts. Huh? Uh, through my research and through my understanding about AI, there are so many more. But I'm just trying to... <coughs> give you an idea of about the key AI concepts, right? 
So hope you are following along. Yeah. Again, uh, let me know uh, if you have any questions. You can put it in the Q and A. So what are the real world applications of AI? Where do we see AI delivering value? One of the places where AI can deliver a lot of value is healthcare. Uh, in disease diagnosis, for example, IBM Watson Health is used for cancer diagnosis, right? Uh, Path AI for pathology. Drug discovery, discovering new drugs and how drugs uh, impact and help with some of these diseases. Uh, we have things like DeepMind's AlphaFold predicts protein folding, right? Benevolent AI accelerates drug development for diseases. Uh, AI in healthcare also can help personalize medicine. For example, understanding the, the symptoms and the root cause of uh, what's impacting your health, we can then also look at the medical history and then uh, use it to recommend the new drugs or the right drugs. What about finance? So we do see this a lot, for example, like fraud detection, right? Uh, PayPal uses machine learning to understand, right? How people do payments, how people do money transfers and transactions. Um, MasterCard use AI to see what we call um, outlier detection, a normal purchasing behavior. For example, if you don't always shop in this place, suddenly you go and shop, MasterCard can tell, hey, something is wrong here. And, and I see this often, uh, every time I go uh, shopping, let's just say I go to a certain uh, supermarket and I buy things from there. I don't get a message that, that tells me that, hey, we detected that you're shopping here because they know. But if I were to make a sudden purchase in another supermarket, I would get a message and say, hey, did you just buy from this? Right? And through the patterns, it helps uh, MasterCard or Visa to even detect if the you, ca credit cards are being used incorrectly. Yeah, uh, Algorithmic trading, looking at the data in terms of predicting the, the, the way markets will go, financial markets will go, and credit storing, scoring based on your purchase history, your social media behavior. Mm -hmm. So be very careful what you post in social media. So AI can use your social media postings, your online purchase, your financial history to see if you are credit worthy or not. Should banks give you loan? Are you able to repay your loan? And things like that. So nowadays, they sometimes even use this to decide on if you should get a credit card. Not sure how uh, if Malaysia is doing that. Uh, <laughs> because sometimes you see, see, see these credit card salespeople in, in supermarkets, but uh, in US and in a lot of countries, they use this to say, hey, uh, should we even give you a credit card? Because are you going to default on it? Other examples, manufacturing, quality control, AI can look at the products that is built to see any defects, right? And then uh, alert those who are building it to fix it. Predictive maintenance, for example, uh, Siemens uh, actually use AI for predictive maintenance, especially for their uh, lift, lift systems and things like that, so that we can predict when something might break and then go and fix it so it doesn't happen. GE uses uh, AI for predictive analytics in manufacturing. Uh, robotics is part of manufacturing where a lot of these tasks, activities will be are replaced by machines rather than carried out by humans because humans, again, are more important than just doing menial manual tasks. Humans like us, we have a capability, AI within us, our brain, right, that can do greater stuff. So AI uh, or robots can take more dangerous, repetitive stuff or activities. What well, about transportation? Okay, self-driving cars. We all know that, right? Tesla has autopilot. Uh, Uber has his self-driving cars, right? Uh, and we are not there yet. One day we will come where come to where uh, this is going to be very normal. I remember um, many years ago watching a movie called uh, Minority Report where you no, know, the cars in the city are self-driving. That might happen one day, right? Uh, log, uh, tra traffic management, AI can then decide how uh, traffic flow is and then control the traffic lights and even maybe uh, not allow certain areas to, to, uh, to be traveled on due to morning hour traffic or logistics can even plan your traveling routes. Good example is Waze, Google Maps, Apple Maps to even help you get to your destination quicker and safer.
right? Uh, Amazon used to actually improve their delivery routes when they are doing delivery of packages. Customer service, very common place where AI is. For example, the use of chatbots, right? H&M, Sephora, banks use it as the first layer to help solve uh, questions from users, right? Of course, if certain things that are more complicated cannot be solved, then will be escalated. But again, the chatbots can give you very quick uh, information and solutions upfront. Personalized recommendation, like, like things that, oh, like Netflix, right? What do I watch today? So Netflix have an algorithm to actually look at who are your favorite actors, what genre you love to watch, are you a K, K drama person or a uh, American drama series person? And then what and what do you like to watch? Do you like to watch crime? Do you like to watch comedy? And then recommend that. Amazon does that by recommending products based on what you have bought and what other people who have bought and then match out what would be beneficial to you. Nowadays, customer service, we can also use AI in sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, like I mentioned earlier, is to even understand what is the sentiment behind what is said? Because in human language and human emotion, right, when we say we are happy, right, we don't always mean what we say, and the degree of happiness is very different. So by using AI and having sentiment analysis, we can actually look at the words we use. We can actually look at the, the tone we say it, and then this is going to help us understand what do the users actually mean, right? Like, 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 like I said, I'm happy, okay? When you say you're happy, describe or uh, tell me why you're happy. And then I say, oh, I'm happy because today is salary day and now I have my salary ready, I can go shopping and blah, blah, blah. Okay, then based on things you say, I can detect how happy you are and what do you mean by happiness, right? Because somebody can say, I'm happy, but actually feel sad. And, and this is actually very good because again, we can really understand how people think. Scary it is. You know, I can tell you it can be very scary, but again, it can really help in a lot of situations. Okay, so we've talked about what is AI. How do we know if something is AI? The concepts of AI and where AI can be used. In fact, if I say where AI can be used, it can be used in any industry, any organization, any size, right? So, but the implementation of AI is not as simple as a lot of people think. Because I, I know that in organizations, right, a senior leader might say, hey, tomorrow we want to use AI. And then everyone will try to rush and implement AI. But the true fact is, if we don't structurally do this, even though AI is used, we are not getting the true value from it. Okay? That's why I want to introduce to you to an organizational AI framework. A general framework where you can start thinking about how AI can be implemented, how AI can be adopted in our organization. The framework is very simple. It consists of six capabilities or components, right? The components are AI strategy, AI organization, AI architecture, AI technology or technologies, AI processes, and AI continued improvement. And if you look at it, the AI strategy is in the middle of all the other five components. And this is important, right? And, and I'm going to explain one by one how this actually works. And later on in the in the uh, slides, we will do a deeper dive on each of the components. So I'm going to give you a quick overview first. Let's start with AI strategy. At the core of every AI adoption or implementation organization is to have an AI strategy. An AI strategy is basically a roadmap that guides an organization how to plan, how to implement AI, that meets their business objectives. And we got to be remember this, right? Implementing and adopting AI is not just adopting cool technologies like using uh, ChatGPT. It's easy because ChatGPT is there. We can just buy the subscriptions and then use it. 
But again, what if your whole organization finds the value in AI? How do you then expand it? How do you then ensure that you use AI correctly or the people use AI correctly to align to the vision and the business objectives? So it's strategically about aligning AI to your overall goals and vision, developing what the vision is and then aligning it. And based on your AI strategy, the other five components will then come in. You notice there are no arrows huh, in those components. It's because you don't have to do one followed by the next, but you have to consider everything together holistically, driven by the main AI strategy. Okay, so your strategy is very, very important. If you don't have a strategy and a business doesn't understand why they want to do this, then to keep AI going, to get the true value of AI, that will not be possible. The second component I want to talk about is the not the technology part, but the organization and the people part, the AI organization. AI organization basically address how and how we set up AI, right, in terms of the people, the resources, the skills, uh, the responsibilities, right? Uh, most importantly, the culture as well. We need to build an AI organization culture to enable the AI initiative to be successful. We will, in AI organization, talk about, also talk about um, the setting up of a, an AI COE, Center of Excellence, to provide the support and guidance for the entire organization to move forward with AI. Right? But an organization is important. The thinking, the mindset, and culture of AI is important. Let me tell you, uh, in another innovative way of working called Agile, and a lot of you might have heard of Agile, uh, Agile uh, is still very popular, right? It became very popular in 2010 onwards, and it is still very popular today. And a lot of organizations, when they hear that we need to be Agile, we need to be an Agile organization, started embarking on Agile, the Agile journey. Again, nothing wrong with that. It is very beneficial. But through the years, right, studies have shown, uh, uh, that agile adoption, right, is still, again, uh, there's still many failures. Because organizations can understand what agile is, but they, if they don't structurally implement agile, have the right organization in place, because agile has to, a lot to do with your mindset. Huh? If the mindset is not in place, then you cannot be successful. Same applies to AI organization, AI. If the organization is not structured correctly with the right culture and the right roles, we are not going to be successful. And we will talk, be talking about what is the culture that we need to develop and what are the key roles that an organization need to create a good AI structure. The third one would be AI architecture. AI architecture basically is the structural design for AI systems in the organization. For certain AI projects, sure, you can use chat GPT if you wanted to. But again, what is the structure to ensure that chat GPT can be used correctly, that security is maintained, that the structure can continue to support if you want to scale up AI? So we'll be talking about uh, a general AI architecture uh, and the layers that you need to consider. Again, we're not going to talk about what brand to use. Uh. In fact, uh, what brand and what uh, technologies that we are going to use is very much dependent on your AI strategy. And once you have the AI strategy, you can then figure out which one will work for you. Like I say, chat GPT is not for everyone. Some people tell me that if you want to have more uh, human-driven uh, answers, perplexity makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, if you want to have access to wide uh, uh, database, right? Um, Google Gemini works. In some organizations, uh, because you are in a Microsoft environment, right, and you like your emails are all within Microsoft, you could use Microsoft Copilot to help you as well. Again, the, the technologies will be very dependent and the architecture will be very dependent on the strategy. But again, what is the general architecture we are looking at? AI technologies, number four, the tools and technologies. These are software and hardware that will be sitting on these architectures to enable machines to mimic human thinking, 
right? This will allow computers to learn from data. And, and in this case, when we talk about AI data, right, we're talking about millions and millions, uh, sometimes even terabytes and terabytes of data. How do we even store it? How do we even process it? How do we actually use it together with what is outside in the uh, in, uh, in the world, compile it to then actually help us with good decision making? AI processes are important. AI processes, which is number five, focuses on the activities we need to carry out to actually collect the data, clean the data, create models, AI models, uh, to get information from data and decision making. In AI processes, there are three processes that has to work hand in hand together. The AI development process, where we actually do the work of AI development, the governance process to ensure that uh, policies are set to govern AI and the AI management process to enable the govern the, that the governance is carried out, that the development and the support is provided. Again, we will look in more details as we go along. And of course, the last one is AI continual improvement. AI is not perfect. Like I said, it is always dependent on the strategy, on the processes, the technology, architecture, and the organization. And in AI continual improvement, our focus is to continually monitor, analyze, uh, refine AI models so that it gets better over time. Not only just AI models, right? For a simple uh, project where we use ChatGPT, even refine our, uh, what you call that, the, 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 uh, refine our uh, prompts, our questions. You notice, right, when you write prompts or questions uh, and ask ChatGPT, right, you notice that when you refine it, right, when you add more information, you formulate the question differently, you get different results. So the continuous improvement helps us with that. And, continue, and, and, and some people say, why do you use the word continual improvement, not continuous? So improvements is continuous. Right, because we shouldn't stop improving until our AI is perfect. That's not going to happen, right? Yeah, because new data is coming in. The word continual means that we do, we plan for the improvements, we then carry it out, but then we stop and check to see if we have done it correctly or not, and then plan and carry out. So there are cycles of improvement, not continuous without any checks or any, uh, what do you call that? Um, corrections. So these five capabilities or six capabilities or components are very important to enable us to structurally build a good agile environment and help us to adopt agile much better in the organization. Yeah. Okay. Let's first look at AI strategy. The very core important aspect of AI adoption in organization. Again, what is AI strategy? An AI strategy is a roadmap that guides an organization to how to plan to leverage AI to achieve business objectives, right? It is all about creating a long-term vision. A vision is what you want to achieve in 10 to 20 years time, and then creating short-term strategies, right? And then, applying AI uh, and planning how AI will be used along these roadmaps to achieve the vision. So I, I just put in graphic, like maybe you started in 2012. You started. So when you plan, you might want to plan to maybe 2032. Maybe 2062 is too far. 2032. So from 2012 to 2032 is 30 years. So in your vision in 30 years, this is one, what we want to achieve. Maybe even not 30 years, maybe 10 years. But from here to here, we need to strategize how we want to implement AI, how we want to grow it, how we want to maintain it. That's important, right? Unless you use AI for one project, which you might start out, because again, if you want to test AI out, you should do pilot projects for it. But in every organization, I don't ex I don't think that they just will use AI in one project because if a project AI project is successful, they want to increase and they want to align to see how the organization can leverage on it. So 
why are AI strategy important? Why is AI strategy important? Okay, number one is it is important because it has to align AI with the business goal. You're not doing AI just because it's something nice and everyone is doing it. You want to do AI so that your decision making, right, your achievement of your business goals and your vision becomes more, much more uh, efficient, much more effective, right? Number two, having an AI strategy gives you better data for decision making. It again aligns with what you're trying to do. There's a lot of data out there. Some is some of them are meaningless. It doesn't help your organization. So once you have a strategy, we know what are the problems we want to solve. We know what are the things we want to do. We can then ask the right information, collect the right information, ask the right questions, use and verify the right in data. Number three, it helps us to facilitate efficient resource allocation. So with AI, we don't want to, when we implement AI, we don't want to do something called job creation. And some of you might not understand what job creation is, right? But basically the idea of job creation is to create a job just for the sake of creating it. Oops, sorry. Yeah. In this case, we want to make sure that we understand where we are going with AI and then get in the right people for the right roles so that the resources are used correctly. We want to use the important AI strategy is to provide a framework for risk management. What is a risk? A risk is an event that can happen. And risks are both either uh, negative, which are known as threats, or positive, known as opportunities. So with an AI strategy, we know areas that we might need to actually uh, manage correctly or come up with a mitigation plan so it doesn't cause our AI to fail. And with risk, proper risk management, we can see other opportunities where we can use AI. Having a strategy allows us to see how to grow, scalability and innovation, which area we need to actually uh, strengthen, which area that we don't need. It also fosters cross-departmental collaboration. Having an AI strategy means that it is not an IT project. It becomes an organizational business project where business will come together and see how we can create an AI structure where every part of business can get value from. Yeah, because in an organization, we are all supposed to align to the overall vision. So having an AI strategy helps us align to what that vision is for AI uh, deployment or implementation. And then the departments can then decide how best to to collaborate to achieve this. It is good for uh, future growth and competitive advantage, understanding, comparing yourself with your competitors, right? Understanding where are the gaps and how to strategize to, to do this. Uh, having a good AI strategy drives ethical AI adoption. I know that in a lot of uh, things we do, right? Um, I'm not saying that you're not ethical, but uh, in AI, because you are managing a lot of data and you are asking a machine to actually give you uh, uh, data for decision making, the machine right now or AI right now cannot actually balance between what is correct, what is wrong, what is ethical, what is unethical. A good example is, right, uh, one of the, the, the earlier uh, AI uh, software right, or AI uh, systems, right? Uh, unfortunately, can't really de detect people with darker skin. That is, a, that, is a, that is quite an ethical issue, right? A very biased issue. That means people with lighter skin, no problem. People with darker skin, people from uh, Africa or India, right? Or, or even US itself, they actually get ignored. And of course, uh, AI will give you the best answer to, uh, to, to actually achieve something. And sometimes the answer might not be ethical, might actually, might actually be not legally correct either. That's why having an AI strategy, we can then formulate policies on where AI uh, and the rules where AI can operate in. 
Later on, I will actually introduce a role that you might not see in a lot of other uh, implementations, the role of an AI ethicist. <laughs> so we say, huh? Is there such a thing? Yes. An AI ethicist ensures that AI complies to ethical uh, decision making. That means things that is not correct, things that is illegal, is not considered at all. And of course, important of AI strategy helps us to then facilitate governance and compliance, making sure that we are aligned to those policies. So that's those are the importance of an AI strategy. And those are the ones that sets the foundation of AI adoption in your organization. So how do we then create a policy? I mean, or create a strategy, sorry. So to define an AI strategy, you need to consider a lot of things. I have actually uh, reduced some of the uh, the activities here, right? Uh, and because some of these activities can be combined. And if you want to find out the details of how to do certain things, uh, we won't be discussing it today because again, uh, some of these details is very dependent on understanding your current organization. But the first activity to define an AI strategy is to define clear business objectives. Basically, what's the vision of the organization? What are you trying to achieve? What are your objectives? And then number two is to understand our current capabilities. Assess AI readiness and infrastructure. Sometimes to the senior management, right? Everyone should be ready for AI. IT should have the infrastructure for AI. That is not true. We need to assess what are the things we currently have that could be used to contribute to AI? What are the things that we need to bring in? Are the people even ready, uh, uh, what do you call that, culturally or not? Because if you announce something AI, people, there, there are some people who are not ready. And how we even uh, communicate AI, right? We also got to be very careful because uh, the, 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 the thinking right now eh, for a lot of people is, oh, if AI come in, I will lose my job. That is not necessarily true, eh? right? So we need to assess readiness, okay? So define clear business objective, assess AI readiness and infrastructure. Number three, you have to plan for change management. Plan to change the organizational thinking and the acceptance of AI. And of course, plan to now realign your workforce. Things that are uh, can be replaced by AI, you have to plan to uh, help people to even reskill, right? Plan different roles that is aligned to AI adoption. Number five, part of change management is to plan a data-driven culture. So AI depends a lot of data and AI can provide very good decision-making based on the data. AI doesn't do guesswork uh, or based on experience type of thinking. Uh. AI looks at the data plus the experience of people, the experience of success, the failures, makes decision making. So in this case, the more data that AI has, the better it's, it's decision making. So again, we need to build a culture where we collect data, we see data is important, and actually this will help with AI implementation. In fact, to actually implement and adopt good AI, you need to have good big data practices and processes because big data is where we collect a lot, huge amount of data, clean it, and then transform it for use. And then AI will use the data to help with, with the decision making. So the big data section or the data section has to be strengthened. We need to start investing in talents and skills and development part of workforce adaptation, right? That means getting people of the right skills. Uh, there is one term I, I heard uh, about a year back, uh, which is stuck to me. Eh? If you're going to hire people for AI and have a strategy of hiring people, you need to start strategizing to hire for the future, right? People with current, current skills are not good enough. You want to hire people who have the current skills and have the ability to jump into new things. So hire for the future. We need to define part of AI strategy, the ethical AI, uh, ethical AI and governance. 
Governance is to make sure we do things correctly. Ethical AI is to make sure that when we do things, it is legal, it is not going to cause us any harm. In fact, uh, a lot of large companies like Microsoft, IBM, right, they have agreed, right, and they have actually signed, a, signed an agreement with a lot of other companies to say that AI, if possible, must not be used for war or any harm on human beings because AI can actually uh, uh, speed up processes and actually can actually do a lot of damage if it's not properly managed. So ethical AI has to be planned. Part of the AI strategy is to decide what are the pilot projects that is easy to be uh, implemented with AI and can, can show quicker success so that we can see if this is the AI adoption that we want or do we need to change? While we start with pilot projects, we also need to start strategizing what is the long-term AI strategy, right? So we will do long-term planning, medium-term planning, short-term planning. And most of all, at the end of the day, all this is important, but it has to ensure alignment with business goals. See, it comes back to the front where you define business goals, and then in the strategy, how do we continue to monitor that it aligns with business goals? And if it doesn't align, what are we going to do? And this will then lead to the question or the capability of AI continual improvement. Strategy is important. right? If you go in blind, you're not going to get the most value from it. Simple as that. Yeah, not sure how many of you like to watch football. Yeah, I, I'm not a big football person, but you know what interests me in football? Uh, interests me in football, uh, why the managers, football managers and coaches, actually strategize. What what is the combination uh, or the 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 the, the work at that? Uh, how the players will play, right? Uh, in football, some some people will follow certain rules. Okay, uh, two strikers in front, four percent in the midfielder, and so on. Right. So and and if you notice in football, right, do you, when they play, right, uh, and and during halftime, if they know they're not playing well, the football team is not playing well, they can align again because the ultimate business goal for any football team is to score as many goals as possible and win the match. So again, we must constantly align to see if a, that AI implementation or adoption align with business goal. If not, we need to change it. Okay, so hope that hope that kind of sets your mind thinking. Huh? Again, if you're asking me, so what's the solution? Then how do we do it? That's another discussion that we can take it with you right uh, after uh, today and then help you with that. Because in order to actually do this, it's not as easy as, oh, follow a five-step plan, follow a six-step plan, and everything will go well. We need to understand your organization maturity. We need to understand how much resources and how invested are you in your organization, what's your business goals, then that can be uh, then that can be more successful. But these are some thinking points that will allow you to go back to your organization after today to start, hey, okay, I need to start thinking about these things before I even move forward, okay? Right, based on the strategy, we now need to think of the second component or second capabilities, which is the AI organization. At the end of the day, no matter how good your AI is, people and structures have to be in place. People is actually, even with AI, right? People is in the core of everything. Even if AI can make decisions, right? It is the people that provide them the data to make these decisions. So the AI organization is important. So the AI organization element addresses how organization can structure themselves to set up AI roles and have the right culture. That's why if we look at this diagram, uh, they, they are intertwined. They work hand in hand. For example, you can get the best people for AI, but if the culture is not correct, the people cannot actually help you deliver this AI or implement or adopt the AI correctly. 
What do you mean by culture? Culture is the mindset, is how we make decisions on what to do. Right? That's very important. So we're going to start off the conversation with the culture first. So what sort of culture that is required for successful AI adoption? Number one, you must have a culture of a, a, a change-ready culture. Change-ready culture means that we must be able to accept change. In fact, AI introduces change at an even greater speed. For example, let's just say if you're making decisions on the direction of uh, what products you want to sell. Right? AI, through looking at trends, can tell you, hey, uh, within the next two weeks, uh, another product, you have to replace your product because it's no longer relevant. I like to always joke uh, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm in a generation where Facebook was very popular. Right? Some of you might be in the same generation as I am, right? <laughs> but you notice, right, the culture has changed so fast. And sometimes uh, we of the slightly older generation are not ready for it, right? And, and, and we do expect some of these things happening in the organization. But if the, the organization must en enable people to be change ready. So like, like, like right now, if you ask me... Uh, what is the social media tool that you still use that works for you? For me, it's still Facebook. Oh, or call it FB. I can't call it Facebook, right? It makes me sound very old. Yeah. <laughs> but for the younger generation, it's now TikTok. In fact, even uh, shopping, uh, I, I know for, for me, I still love Shopee and Lazada, uh, things like that. But for the younger generation, right, Shopee and Lazada is no longer re relevant. Now they go for something called influencer shopping or TikTok shopping which is a whole new thing. So we have to have the cultivate, cultivate a change-ready culture. Number two, leadership must support and buy into AI. What do I mean by this is, when leadership says that they want to implement AI in the organization, they must fully support it. In fact, the leaders must drive the behavior. Leader can just say that, oh, uh, AI is just an IT thing, right? Don't get us involved. Right? I will give you some money for IT to do AI, but business shouldn't be involved. That is not true. Leaders of all parts of the organization must buy in and support. Number three, for AI to be successful and adopted, the clear AI vision and benefits must be communicated. Everyone must understand why we are doing this. What are the value we get if we are doing this? How does it help the company? How does it help the staff and employees? Right? A lot of times where, where the, the senior leaders want something to be done and the, the, the people in operations don't do it is because the people in operations don't understand what's the benefit of doing it. It might benefit the senior management to say that, oh, in, if we implement AI, we are uh, competing at the business level with our competitors. But for those in operations, sometimes they don't see it. To them, this is too high, up in the clouds, right? So I need to also communicate a clear vision of how AI will benefit me or the, the people in operations in what they do. So there must be clear AI vision. And you're not only just doing this one time, huh? have a town hall, announce AI, and that's it. You need to constantly remind people the importance of why this must be done and how it impacts them. Number four, you need to change the skills through training and development. Okay, uh, I know some people, when I say this, when I, the, the next sentence I say, a lot of people will say, well, Sean, because you work for consultancy and training, you will try to push training. And, and that's, not the, not, that's not the reason. The reason is simply this. If you want skills of, the tomor of tomorrow, you need to train people to be able to do what tomorrow needs. Technology is changing so fast. The way business is thinking with the application of AI is changing so fast. We need to constantly learn, right? So we're not talking about just technical training. Business training is needed. Soft skills training is needed. Uh, management leadership training is needed in this environment. So, and, and training is not just one offer. You need to plan. What are the training that's needed and how to support the people doing this? 
right? Oh, uh, unfortunately, my slides were not created by AI. That's why you still see mistakes, right? <laughs> so for example, this is not four, this is actually five. Five, foster collaboration between humans and AI. You're not going to fully dependent on AI because again, AI by itself has no value unless humans provide the data and the question and the, and, and the guidance, right? So uh, humanize your AI, basically. Use it to complement your day-to-day. -day. Don't be afraid of AI. Actually embrace it to help you achieve certain work. Number six, part of AI is to actually incorporate the mindset change and the principles of change management into AI rollouts. Not sure how many of you have heard of something called the Kubler-Ross uh, change curve. Okay, if you have not heard of it, just go and Google it later or ask AI about it. But a uh, psychologist named Kubler-Ross actually came up with the seven stages of uh, human changes, right? For example, when you introduce something new, right, the first things that impact people is shock. Oh, you're introducing AI. Wow, I never, I never knew, right? And this also affects our, what you call that, our performance, right? And then from shock, we normally go to the second stage where, where it's called denial. Denial means that uh, this is not happening, lah, right? Uh, uh, this is not happening. Uh, I don't think the company is serious about this. And then people start to feel a bit agitated. So throughout the entire AI rollout, there must be proper change management activities to help the organization go through. It is a journey. And we have to make sure that the, the people can accept it. In fact, uh, a lot of times people can affect change, uh, can, can accept changes. For example, we can change our handphones, change our clothes, we can accept it. But the difficult part of accepting changes is basically the transition to it. Transition is a psychological aspect, right, of how we move towards things. So if we don't help people transition, it's not gonna work. Number seven. AI use, you should promote transparency and ethical AI use, definitely. You should set rules on how to use AI, where you can use it, when you can use it, and all the data that you collected for AI should be available for everyone. Transparency. So that we can ensure governance and compliance. In fact, uh, if you share all the information you have uh, with AI, share all the information we, uh, with everyone else about AI, all the results you get, it will also help other parts of the business to even get value from what you have asked. And because AI is not something static, we are even moving to neural networks and other AI, we need to encourage continuous learning, experimentation and improvement so that more value can be derived from our AI adoption. So all these things are very cultural and mindset. If let's just say, right, or your organization right, is not always doing experimentation and improvement, improvements, right? Then that's a problem where you do not, you will just follow what AI uh, vendors will tell you. To experiment is to try out which one will work for us, which one is the most beneficial to us. And that is a very important aspect. So part of the AI organization is the mindset culture, and the behaviors. Then we can only talk about the roles. And one of the first role or group of, uh, or a function that I want to introduce before we even talk about the, 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 the individual roles is basically the AI center of excellence. So when we talk about organizational change and culture, so how do we drive this? Sometimes, right? Uh, we need a group of people, a function, to help us ro even roll this out. That's why in every organization, one of the things that you want to set up would be an AI center of excellence. A centralized team, a function, or a department within an organization that is not IT, eh? that's across the organization that provides guidance, resources, experimentation capabilities, uh, 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 advice, 
on all things AI to allow you to align to your AI strategic goals. So within the Center of Excellence, you would have uh, engineers, you will have analysts, you will have uh, uh, data people who will help provide advice to the business on, hey, you want to do AI? This is how we do it. Sometimes AI Center of Excellence could have guides, templates, right? Uh, if you want resources, hey, I'm doing this project and I don't know who are the people for this AI project. The Center of Excellence can provide you the guidance. It is good to have one, right? Uh, in fact, I will, I will actually show you some companies, uh, local and also international, that has built a center of excellence. Again, center of excellence is not only static as well. It continues to grow with new AI technology. They are, the, they are a group of people that is very ahead in helping organization apply or adopt AI. So what is the role of Center of Excellence? Number one, assist in developing AI strategy and roadmap with the business. Help build AI capabilities by recognizing which area of AI that we need to send people for training and development. Promote AI adoption through uh, workshops, through town halls, through messaging. Help uh, look at the AI solutions and which one will be suitable for which project. Uh, manage AI infrastructure. In this case, the managed AI infrastructure is not uh, operational management. Uh, it's to make sure that the infrastructure is actually capable of ensuring AI can be used fully or utilized fully. Ensure ethical AI, make sure AI uh, work within the bounds of the policy and what is uh, legal. Monitor and evaluate AI performance and then work with the different teams to actually enhance it or maintain it. And of course, work with different parts of the organization to ensure that when you do an AI project or initiative, all the right people are in place and they are working together. The word collaboration is a very important word. Collaboration actually means we are all focused on the same shared values, which is why we are adopting AI and how it along, aligns to the business strategy. Okay. So having an AI COE or center of excellence is important. That it's a just a, uh, a, a centralized group of people or function that helps drive AI more correctly. So some people say, are there any examples of these uh, functions and, and which company uses it? Locally, Petronas does that. Right, Petronas actually accelerates the development and deployment of AI solutions in their energy industry, right? And of course, uh, for Petronas, they are not an AI company, right? They are an energy company. So they collaborate with global partners like Baker Hughes, Boston Consulting Group, Microsoft to set this up. So some part of the uh, COE actually uh, is delivered from Microsoft. Iberdola or Iberdola, which is a Spanish electric com utility company, right? So this is something more international. Uh, launch AI COE to explore and implement AI solutions for electricity, electricity uh, sector. So they use AI, right, to actually manage power grids. Of course, uh, for their COE is to provide guidance on how this will be set up. Uh, our neighbor, Singapore, uh, Singapore actually launched something called AI Manufacturing. And AI Manufacturing is not a company. It's basically a department, right, within the, uh, the set up by the Singapore government. And this AI COE for manufacturing focuses on developing AI solutions for quality assurance, optimization, uh, operations optimization in the manufacturing industry. So that any organization many in manufacturing wants to implement AI, they can go to this uh, center of excellence to ask for assistance and guidance when they want to set up, set these things up. So you can set it up within an organization, a country, a, a, a ministry, like in, in Malaysia, you can set it up in Ministry of in, uh, Information or Technology to provide guidance. You can set it up within your organization or you can set it up within your industry if you want to. But having an AI COE helps us to then get the necessary resources and help to implement this correctly. Okay. So I know I've been talking a bit, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
covers some roles, some individual roles uh, or some key roles in AI. And then we are going to take a short uh, 10 minutes break, right? Maybe let's, let's see, maybe 10 to 15 uh, for a comfort break. So you can go and refill your water tumblers, refill your coffee, use the washroom, do some stretches, and then we will come back and continue with the other uh, four capabilities, right? Okay. Before we do that, let's look at the key roles for AI. AI strategies or AI lead. Someone who will help define the organization's AI vision, strategy, and roadmap, right? Somebody who will lead this effort at an organization level. Huh? Some people say, hey, can I use, again, can I appoint my, uh, my uh, head of IT to do this? No. AI is not just pure technology. AI is using technology for decision making. There's a lot of the business areas and the non-IT areas that needs to be involved. So an AI strategist or lead, or you can call them an AI champion, is in more of an overall organization role, working with the business and technology to ensure the right vision is developed. Second key role is having a data scientist. AI is, after all, data. Data driven. So an a data scientist is a person that creates models right, uh, to run on this data to help us find uh, uh, predictions or prescriptions or help us with decision making. We need a machine learning engineer, a person who are able to uh, build the, the models for uh, machine learning. Of course, the, the algorithms within the models, this will be created by the data scientist. But these are the people who will be able to use uh, application or software and include all these algorithms so that we can create a model that we can run over and over again. We need a data engineer to make sure that the data can come in and flow correctly in. It is properly clean, properly labeled, properly structured for the use of AI project. For example, uh, if let's just say video data is coming in, what structure or video format are we going to use? Do we need to convert it uh, to one format like MP4, right? Nowadays, a lot of companies do that, convert to one format so that we can then process it more efficiently. Uh, AI, machine learning, research scientists, basically research the, and to develop new algorithms and techniques. So working very closely with the data scientists. Right, looking at uh, exploring theoretical aspects of AI and machine learning, improving model accuracy and efficiency for use. Other key roles include, like I said, a lot of people might be taken aback, huh? Is there such a role as an AI ethicist? An AI ethicist makes sure that AI right, complies with ethical guidelines such as fairness, transparency, and accountability. Yeah, uh, recently, I, I think for the last week or so, um, there was a, a hurricane that hit US, right? Uh, and it, uh, it passed through Florida yesterday. Um, yeah, uh, and it was quite, it's quite devastating, right? It's called Hurricane Milton. They, they actually were hit by two hurricanes, Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton. Ah, uh, Milton, not Milton, Milton, right? Unfortunately, uh, when uh, the U.S. government was asked, right, why, uh, what is the uh, most uh, problematic thing that's helping to save uh, or to, to, to help, uh, provide help to people during this hurricane? What is the most uh, constraint, problematic constraints? And do you know what the uh, people doing the work says or not? False news or fake news. For example, what has been floating around, there was a picture of this girl holding a puppy uh, showing in a flood. And a lot of people, and a lot of people say that, oh, no, US, uh, the, 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 uh, the, what that? the FEMA, FEMA is in, as in emergency services are not doing enough to save these people. When in fact, the picture of the girl holding a puppy is a fake AI generated picture. So AI ethicists will have to make sure that all AI information will be used fairly, transparently, and there's accountable, accountability on it. 
software engineers, developers is to build AI models and implement software applications for AI use. Data analysts is to analyze data uh, to make sure that uh, we can find trends and patterns in the data and formulate the right questions to ask. Business analysts will act as a liaison between the AI team and the business stakeholders to even figure out what are the problems business is facing and what sort of information that's needed. And product manager is basically, if you're delivering your AI as a tool or a product to the business, these are the people who will help the business to even know how to implement it and use it in their day-to-day. -day. So some key roles for AI. Of course, this is just, this is just key roles. Huh? There are other supporting roles that are important. For example, uh, the, some uh, senior business roles are important, right? Uh, operation people are important. People who are maintaining the backend systems, they are all important as well to support the AI or the implementation and adoption of AI. Okay, we shall take a break now. I think some of you uh, might be tired of hearing me. <laughs> I know I'm very, uh, I'm very excited. I sound very excited, right? Uh, and I'm always very excited with AI because I see the vast potential uh, benefits from AI if it's done in a very structured manner, done correctly. So what I'm going to do is we're going to take a break, right? And I'm going to actually set the clock to do this. Uh, we're going to take a 15 minutes break and then we'll come back and talk about uh, the rest of the capabilities, the architecture, the technologies, the processes, and continuous improvement. So I'm going to set my clock for 15 minutes. I'm going to share my clock, and then I will see you in 15 minutes, and we will start sharp. Once the clock ends, we will begin. Okay? Have a good break.
Hey everyone, welcome back. Hope you had a nice short break uh, to actually stretch your legs. And as we continue to look at the other uh, four capabilities. But before we do that, I want to actually, I, I look through the Q&A and I want to address a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I think this is more of a, a, not a question, but a statement. Uh, and I saw this and say that AI implementation has a framework uh, that, well, just to let you know, actually, right, unfortunately, right, there are no uh, standardized framework for AI implementation. And that's why we see a lot of organizations struggling with adopting and implementing it, right? So like I said, uh, like uh, where I work, my imagine, uh, and what I do is to also help develop some of these so that organizations and industries can then apply and have some sort of guidance to implement, not just purely technical, right? Te uh, technology, we will need the technology people to also come and assist, but as an organization-wide, what are the ways we can actually successfully do this, successfully do this? Of course, it is just a kind of a framework. A framework is just a, a, a mapped out guidance and you can change the contents of the framework as you would like. But again, we will just want to give you some sort of a structure so that you can consider this uh, correctly. The other question is, uh, can, 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 can we share the slides with you all? Uh, yes, we will. What I'm gonna do is, um, I'm not gonna give you the slides. <laughs> I'm gonna convert this into PDF and then uh, get, I will get uh, info track to send that out to to all of you. Uh, and and if you're confused, hey, who is Mind Imagine? What do we have to do with info track and course? So Mind Imagine and info track, we are uh, partners, right, in helping to deliver some of these uh, training, education, and concepts to to benefit uh, all of you. Okay, so if you do have any questions later on, I will give you some contact emails. You can either contact me directly with your questions and or you can reach out to InfoTrack or Mind Imagine uh, to explore more and see how we can help you to be more successful. Okay, uh, the other thing that was brought to me was uh, a very close friend of mine, right, uh, who, who is listening in as well. Uh, and she was saying that, hey, you mentioned about the picture of the girl and the dog, right? Uh, do, do you, can you show so that we can actually see what you're talking about, which, which picture you're talking about? And I thought that was a super idea, something that I should have done, but I missed out. Uh, I'm going to show you the picture eh, so you know which one I'm talking about. It's actually uh, this one, okay? This is the one. If you, if you have seen it, this is actually AI generated. Amazing, isn't it? Right? Uh, of this picture of a girl with the puppy and they're in the boat during the recent hurricane in Florida. It looks so real. Uh, of course, if you look uh, much closer, uh, some people say that you can tell the difference, but uh, if we are not too careful, like, like I said, this is not ethical, right? Uh, using a picture of a child and a dog, which didn't really happen to actually uh, talk about uh, things that weren't done in the flood. So we, that's why an AI ethicist is actually important to make sure that whatever AI information we use or generate is done correctly uh, in the most ethical way, okay? Okay, let's get back to the slides. Okay, so before we went for a break, we talked about uh, the AI strategy, the core of uh, your AI adoption, what's your strategy, right? And of course, the AI organization, the culture and the people. Now we are gonna to move towards more on the technical part. Again, I'm not gonna go into, hey, what tools are we gonna use? How are we gonna do this? That is going to be a conversation that has to happen once we have developed a strategy and once you understand what your, your setup is gonna be like, right? But, the AI architecture basically focuses primarily on the structural design for your AI system, right? Even some people say that, well, I don't need this. I'm using ChatGPT. You still need to have a structural design. For example, how is ChatGPT going to be accessed? 
what is the security that you have place, put in place to make sure that ChatGPT uh, or the information that you capture from ChatGPT is not uh, simply shared out or, or people can't hack through the system. Right? So you need to have the architecture in place. For example, the components, how they interact, the flow of data, uh, the process within the system. An architecture basically is a blueprint to address your specific technical and business needs for AI in terms of sustainability, scalability, maintainability, efficiency, efficient, uh, efficiency, and uh, yeah, and effectiveness. Okay. So, what is the general AI architecture? I, I, I'm mentioning this uh, is because, uh, like I said, there are many architecture states out there. For example, NVIDIA has their own architecture. IBM has their own architecture, right? And depending on what you're trying to do, you can adopt some of these architectures or you can actually uh, uh, decide to build your own. But in general terms, there are basically six layers that you should have for AI adoption. The first one is called data layer. Data layer is where the data is collected, storage, and processed. So in this case, we're talking about having uh, databases. And in, 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 in AI, since we're considering big data, we need to talk about distributed uh, storage, distributed processing. We need to talk about data lakes and then the scalability of how this information is stored. But I said, because AI uh, is linked to large amounts of data using concepts, solutions, or ideas like Hadoop or cloud-based like database, that's going to help. Second one would be the data preparation layer, data cleaning, not just the collection and storage, but the cleaning, the transforming, and the labeling of data is important, right? So basically, in this layer, raw data is clean, right? It's transformed, it's labeled, so that we can then link to uh, when it will be used, how it will be used, based on what questions or what problems. So that is the data layer by itself, uh, right? You have two layers. And then we come down to the model building layer. Model building layer is where we build algorithms and select uh, the algorithms, train the algorithms, tune it so that it can process the data based on the questions you're asking it. And once the models have been built, this is where your AI research is going to happen, your data scientists, all these people are going to come in, right? You then have to do model deployment layer, uh, layer. So where does the model sit, right? How does the model link, right? Uh, again, uh, how do we uh, ensure that the model can be accessible to everyone? So it's all about model serving, model integration, model scaling into your environment. So, the data provi layers provide the, the, the data and the measurement layer of the data. The models are carried out to transform the data into uh, information for decision making. And of course, uh, we need to maintain all these layers. That's why we have the monitoring and maintenance layer to make sure we do performance tracking, uh, retraining of data, retraining of models, uh, sending out alerts if something were to fail, and to make sure that we are aware of areas that is not performing effectively, we need to, again, improve. Because AI requires the proper use of it and the proper management of it, there is a business layer that is important. And this layer also has technical, because again, you're talking about building systems to ensure this is done. What we call AI governance and compliance layer. This is where we set the ethical uh, rules and guidelines, the security policies and implement uh, firewalls and security management in this place, and of course, legal compliance. Because remember, when you get take data from different sources, right, uh, from outside of your organization, you also have to comply legally because some data, you cannot just simply publish it without the permission of the data owners. So the description of the AI governance and compliance area uh, layer is to adhere to ethical guidelines, make sure the security policies and po uh, protocols are in place and the regulatory requirements are in place. 
some people say, uh, Sean, you mentioned that uh, in AI, right? It has to be transparent. What if some company data cannot be shared? Can only be viewed by certain levels, like like financial data within your organization. Of course, when it comes to uh, project financial data and some of these things can be shared. But again, what about financial data as a whole? How the company is doing, uh, all these things, right? There are some things that cannot be shared. So this is where the regulatory requirements will also come in. For example, if somebody were to search certain uh, information within the company, right? Uh, some of this information will be blocked. So all these things have to be thought of. Yeah? But of course, uh, like I said, being transparent doesn't mean that you show everything. Being transparent means that you, whatever that is important that helps us achieve the business goals should be available as much as possible. Okay? So that's the architecture. So in terms of architecture, remember there's a balance between the business and the technical, and this has to collaborate together to enable us to then uh, decide how to build the uh, and support the uh, AI that we are trying to implement. So the architecture is basically the design or the blueprint, like how AI will then be built on. What are the security policies? What are the systems we will be building on? So the systems itself, which is are the hardware and the software used for data, that falls under the capability of AI technologies. Again, AI tools and technologies are software and hardware that enables machines to mimic human intelligence. So this is where the data will be processed or instructions will be provided, questions will be asked, decisions will be made. Right? So these are hardware and applications that will help us with the decision making. There are many AI technologies. Again, I have compiled it into some general AI technologies that we can use. Uh, I have given some examples of some brands out there. It doesn't mean that uh, those are the best brands. Again, those are some example ones that you can use. If you look at the architecture, there is a ethical governance compliance layer, okay? that we need to consider to ensure that AI is done correctly. So what sort of AI governance compliance tool are we gonna use? So these tools will help us manage the AI ethics, governance, compliance, and make sure that our data complies to legal standards. So this tool includes IBM OpenScale. Uh, there is uh, another tool called Fairness Indicator by TensorFlow. Right, fairness indicator is basically measuring and ensure that your data is fair. What do you mean by fair? That means it is, it doesn't have bias. That the data is not uh, skewed to just one area, and not have uh, information on another area. Sometimes we we get this information right where where when people send us fake news, right? It's always skewed to just one area, and if we uh. And we, if we accept that information, right, we don't consider other areas. There's no balance. In this case, there are tools to ensure that uh, data is balanced. Uh, in fact, there is a website. Um, uh, I, I forgot what's the name of the website. I, I, I was recently looking at it, and I, I think the website is called uh, Ground or something like that. Uh, Ground, Ground News. Or something. I think it's Ground News, right? Uh, so if you want, you can check it out. Uh, where the news is actually given uh, color dots, right? To say, and this is very American-based. Uh, uh, so Malaysian news, uh, not so much. Uh, but again, world news quite a lot as well. Uh, where they talk, say that, who published this news? Is it the conservative or is it the more progressive? And then uh, is this news too one-sided or uh, to the left or to the right? So you can then see if... Uh, is it balanced or not? So you have fairness indicators that actually do that. Another general AI tool uh, technology would be model deployment and monitoring tools. For example, uh, when you want to roll out AI models for use and then to monitor these tools, for example, like Docker, Kubernetes, MLflow, 
right? Those are some tools for monitoring performance to ensure uh, real world application of your models. In terms of the data preparation layer, we have tools like data labeling and annotation. Data labeling means that I label the data to fall under which category. And what is the data about? We annotate, right? So that we can train for supervised machine learning, right? And of course, uh, for even computer vision, like, oh, this, this picture is from this period of time. This picture is about this. So that we can actually, by looking at the metadata and the information about data, we can then say, oh, is it appropriate or not? Is it applicable or not? Examples are like label box, Amazon SageMaker, uh, Ground Truth, uh, Data Loop, right? All these things. Actually, it's Amazon SageMaker, Ground Ground Truth. Yeah. Uh, we have technologies that help with processing natural language as well, right? So, what we call these natural language processing libraries. This is basically libraries and collection of how people emote, right? How people uh, the words people use. Different countries will have different libraries and then uh, the, the different emotion, uh, the sentiments when people say about something and how they actually feel. So NLTK is one of them. Uh, Spacey, Bird, those are some of the example technologies that's out there. On the data layer, where we are preparing the data and processing and storing the, the data, there are tools to handle that. And this is more of a distributed tool. Distributed means that the data is not stored in just one environment. It is stored in multiple environments, right? And broken up and stored in multiple environments so that the processing of this data is done much more efficiently, right? Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, there is a cost, right? That, that if you're interested, uh, that, uh, that InfoTrack can help you with is a cost on enterprise big data where we talked about, hey, how does distributed processing actually work. So some examples would be things like uh, Hadoop, Apache Hadoop, right? Uh, Spark, Amazon, S3. So again, distributed storage. In terms of machine learning and AI development platforms, platforms for building, tra training, deploying machine learning models, right? This would be things like uh, common, very common ones are TensorFlow, PyTorch, right? Based on uh, Python, uh, Google Cloud AI platform, Azure, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning, Azure ML. Of course, there are cases where when you want to provide information for, uh, for decision making, you cannot provide it in the data form because sometimes business, right? No matter how equipped and how smart they are, sometimes by looking at the data tells you don't understand, you get confused. There are cases where we can actually convert these data into visuals like charts and graphs and even uh, what we call that um, uh, data plots, right? Uh, and then um, what um, histograms and things like that. Yeah. So we have data visualization too. Uh, most common ones, right? We see in uh, the use of data would be Tableau, Power BI, uh, Matplotlib. And of course, uh, to store your data, because in AI, if you're dependent on large amount of data, you might not have your own infrastructure to do that. So now you're looking for a place where you can store and process the data. And one of the options that's available is basically cloud computing. So cloud service offer scalable and flexible computational resources, which are essential for handling complex AI workloads. And we are very, uh, what could that? We we know a lot of these companies that does this. For example, Amazon Web Services, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, right? So many companies do provide some of these capabilities for you to actually store your data, process it, run your AI models, and things like that. Yeah. So again, some general AI technologies that we can use. Of course, some people say, "Hey, Sean." I think you forgot something. Uh. I think you forgot chat GPT. Uh, you, get, you forgot, uh, for example, uh, perplexity or, or, or Gemini or uh, some other tools. No, I didn't. Right? I didn't. All these things are considered the user aspects of uh, AI. Right? 
and uh, like chat GPT, all these things, right? They are part of the uh, what could that the models that you can attach to what you're trying to do. For example, uh, if you want to adopt chat GPT as part of your 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 technology, you can chat GPT has APIs that you can link, right? You can link to your current tools. So I didn't forget that because I look at chat GPT would be under the machine learning AI development platforms or the uh, the a, a cloud computing service. Okay, so, but again, as an organization, I'm also talk, looking at scalability. You cannot depend on chat GPT forever. In fact, you have to also link chat GPT to be able to look at your own data or your, your environment must consider your company data together with data that's outside there so that you can make the best decision. Here's a good example. Eh? Uh, a lot of you most probably have heard that Apple is launching their AI called Apple Intelligence AI. <laughs> Apple likes to name things, by the way. But if you look at Apple Intelligence, right, and how they're doing Apple Intelligence is, the simpler AI tasks that will be managed by Apple. The more complex tasks or AI information that, uh, that Apple wants to provide to you, they are partnering with chat GPT, right? So chat GPT becomes one of the technologies that is integrated with Apple intelligence. And we are all waiting for it. Apparently, uh, for those who have uh, up downloaded the latest iOS, you notice that there's no AI yet. They are saying that that would come in maybe 18.1 or so. And then we will see the power of Apple's AI. Yeah. So we talked about the infrastructure, uh, the architecture, the blueprints. We talked about the technologies. But AI cannot be carried out without the activities, the processes, right? Uh, what, what is a process? A process is con converting your inputs into valuable outputs. That's a process. So the AI, uh, in AI, the technologies and the architecture help with the processing, right? But the activities of doing the processing itself must also be mapped out. Nowadays, we use a, a term called uh, value streams. Value streams that we need to plan out the each activity so that every activity will deliver value to the next activity so that at the end of it, the outputs become aligned to the strategy, becomes more correct. And in AI process, we are not only just looking at the steps and action taken to design, develop, deploy, the AI, but we also need to look at the governance process and the AI management process. So all these three goes hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other, because again, if you're developing, uh, doing the development, but you don't consider the governance and the AI management, you might have an ethical issue or non-compliance issue. If we have governance, policies on how to do big data, uh, I mean, do AI, but you don't manage the governance or carry it out, what happens? The governance is just a piece of blank paper or white paper with words on it. You need to ensure that governance is carried out. So you cannot do it. And governance helps support the right development. So all these things are linked together. So we're going to talk about each tree of the processes. Again, I'm not going to go into so much detail. The details are always, like I said, based on what is our strategy. Let's start with AI development process. So the AI development process is a structured approach to build, deploy, and maintain artificial intelligence models and system. So the process go through multiple stages and, and I actually compiled the, uh, the most general, the general stages of how this will work. AI development process will always start with defining the problem. Important, huh? What is the problem you want to solve? You cannot just tell AI, uh, AI give me answers. AI tell me what to do. AI cannot tell you what to do unless you tell AI what problems or what you're trying to achieve. So you need to identify the AI use cases. 
what problems are you trying to achieve? Or, or are you trying to solve? And from that problem's definition, we need to then decide what data collection and preparation that will help us with solving the problem. Because let's just say you want to solve a, um, a, a process inefficiency uh, problem in your company and your company is manufacturing. So the data you're going to collect will be manufacturing data or maybe of a certain product uh, from your from, from external and also internal. Data regarding movies and music is not going to be helpful. So you have to plan your data collection and preparation. Preparation means clean the data. Data that is no longer relevant, like uh, data for manufacturing in the 1960s. Nope, not relevant. Clean it. And then from there, you need to do data exploration and analysis. This is where your data model is going to come in to analyze the data, to understand the key features, and then label it accordingly. After that, you will start building your models. Choose the algorithms and build your models to actually help process the data. And based on your problem definition and the algorithms, you then train the model. Train and evaluate means you let the model run first and see what the results come in. You know, if you use ChatGPT, right, you would realize uh, that a lot of times, right, the answers provided by ChatGPT doesn't make sense, doesn't apply to you. That's why we need to do model training. Train and validate the models to make sure it supports what your problem is or, or supports the solution to your problem. Once you train, you need to do hyperparameter tuning. Tune the model parameters. For example, scope. What should it cover? What should it not cover? Where should it focus? Where is our focus? Our, our, our scope and things like that. And then deploy the model into production. So for the people to use, monitor and maintain and track the performance of the model. If it doesn't work and if your AI doesn't work, tune it, make sure you improve it, continue improve, continuous improvement and retraining. And of course, once the data comes out, make sure we do ethical review and compliance. Again, there's this ethical part that has to be done because you during the data collection and the model building, you are not going to be able to get all every single result. And it is all dependent on what the questions you ask. So sometimes, and you cannot think about all the questions that people will ask, right? That's why we need to review the answers as well at the end of the day to see if it's uh, aligned with, uh, is ethically aligned or not, and it's compliant or not. And if those things are not ethical or compliant, we need to retrain it to remove certain things. Okay. Mm. Uh, one good example is right now, if you use uh, Google Gemini and you ask Google Gemini to actually uh, modify your photo or modify people in a photo, you, the result you get from Google Gemini is that right now, they don't do this. And they don't do this for two reasons. One is ethical and uh, privacy. Yeah, the other one is uh, they can do this, but again, they are looking at the compliance issue part. Because again, if you, because this can be dangerous, huh? if you just put in any picture, you want to cause some, you just put in a picture and prompt Google Gemini to actually make some changes, that could be unethical. So they actually put in some rules for that for now. Second process we need to do is the governance process. The idea of a governance process is to create a governance structure and a compliance structure for your AI development, right? So it focuses on setting up policies, frameworks, procedure to manage risks, align AI to the organization goal and maintain compliance. So what are the general step-by-step -step in the governance process? The first one is you need to define your AI governance objective based on your company's policy and again on data privacy laws, right? Of course, for any policy that you design, you're not going to design it alone. There's no one data uh, governance person. That's why you need the uh, business analyst to come in. You need a legal to come in. You need the AI ethnicist to come in to do that. So this is where you uh, get people to work together to establish an AI governance framework. 
So make sure that all the laws will be complied with. What are the, let's just say your bank. I need to be able to make sure that uh, we also consider the banking framework or banking uh, requirements by Bank Negara. Right, makes sense. And then you, because the development of policies, like I say, is not done by one person, you, you need to appoint an AI governance committee. This will include your risk management people, your uh, business representation. If you are providing AI tools and services for your customer, your customer representation, legal, ethics, ethics. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> After a while, my my tongue is also <laughs> ethics. Yeah, all this coming to the committee, and the committee will be the governing committee that helps updates the policy. Develop AI risk management practice so that we can recognize potential events that could impact our AI adoption, right? Uh, make sure that uh, we come out with policies to ensure transparency and accountability. Uh, accountability means that ownership of data and information. Part of the governance is to conduct regular audits and compliance checks uh, internal done by the uh, governance committee and the audit uh, audit team. Of course, external, done by external auditors. And of course, part of, because you are applying governance, and if external parties are also uh, contributing to your AI adoption and AI uh, development, you also need to engage them to make sure that they understand on this governance policy. That, that, if you use AI that belongs to a certain company, you also must respect the policies that is linked to it. But governance has no value if this is not followed. That's why the last process is the AI management process. AI management process encompasses all activities, strategies, and policies necessary for effectively implementing, operating, and maintaining. So as those doing AI management, you have to make sure that AI strategy and it aligns with the business goals, right? Make sure that the policy doesn't impede or disrupt the business goals or does not give you the right information. You have to make sure that the data management and governance is carried out, that the, the people who are developing the models and operating AI complies to this, you must make sure that the AI model development and deployment is done correctly. You have to ensure that there are teams to monitor or systems to monitor the performance of the models based on the governance, what was said. You want to make sure that the risk management and compliance is uh, following the risk management policies and whatever compliance that the organization has put in place, governmental, internal, external. You want to make sure that AI operation and maintenance is carried out correctly, that the right people, the right systems are in place to actually ensure AI continues to become valuable. Make sure all life cycles of activities. Some people say, what do you mean by AI life cycle? All these life cycles, right, are carried out correctly and in order. So try to make sure that we don't skip so if, because if we do skip a step, right, the quality of data and the value of AI might be impacted. Yeah. What else? Make sure that the stakeholders know what's going on, are communicated, are providing the updates, and inf right information and reports are given to the right set of people. Make sure that the right roles and responsibilities are defined in the processes and continuous improvement and innovation is part of the process. So if you see, right, all these three have a certain focus area. One is the actual work of building the AI and managing the data. One process focused primarily on creating governance and policies so that you do things correctly and do get yourself in trouble. And one is to manage to make sure you do things effectively. So all these three goes hand to hand. You cannot have one without the other. Okay. And finally, whew, wow. <laughs> so, and finally, we will never get the first thing, first time right. 
and the world and the environment around us are changing. It's changing. And it is changing rapidly. And if we have implemented AI and we don't continue improve it, continue to improve it, what happens? We are not going to be able to align with the changes. We are not going to be able to deliver the full value. AI is not perfect. And in our organization, it cannot be perfect as long as the environment around us and the information around us change. That's why we have to continue to improve. One day, maybe if AI is perfect, then you can stop improving. Uh, but you and I know that that's not possible. Okay? So what is AI continual improvement? The ongoing process of refining and optimizing AI systems to enhance the performance, accuracy, and alignment with business objectives. It's all about uh, monitoring the AI models, uh, retraining the models, redeveloping the models, getting the feedback, right? Uh, make it more efficient, deliver better outcomes to align to the business. Laws are changing as well, right? We also need to improve to maintain, bi minimize bias, right? And maintain compliance and ethical standards, right? Now with the ability to access more and more powerful AI, more harm can actually happen. So we have to maintain this to make sure that it, it is used properly. So what are the key activities for AI continuing improvement? You notice right? I've got a lot of key activities one. Eh? And this is important because again, like I said in the beginning, structure help us to know how to do this correctly. So how do we do continuing improvement? First and foremost, performance monitoring. Track performance of your AI system to make sure that the results are being provided accurately, precision is carried out, uh, business impact is reduced. Right? Make sure that the systems are running, that the, that the models are running careful, correctly. Second way of improvement is finding out from the users and from the business how AI is benefiting them and where are the areas of improvement. For those of us who build AI models, who actually implement AIs, right, we sometimes bring with us biasness because we are looking at, at the very technical aspect of it, right? We sometimes don't consider if the results provided actually achieve the outcomes that the users are looking for. So that's why we need to do constant feedback loops surveys, interviews, uh, what we call that, um, um, uh, focus groups, all these things are important, right? The more feedback you get, the more you understand if the AI actually achieve uh, the right results or not. Number three, your models are not going to be, uh, what we call that, relevant forever. So we need to do model training. Update the AI models with new relevant data, with new mathematical calculations, with new algorithms to reflect the current trend. For example, right, if you use AI right, to understand shopping patterns of people who are shopping online, and the model is only focused on Lazada, Temu, uh, Shopee, and not focused on TikTok shopping, your AI or your information results will actually be wrong. Because as I said, there's a huge shift now uh, from Shopee to influencer shopping. That's why TikTok shopping, everyone's going to TikTok shop, shopping because they sell products quicker there. But I can tell you, in the, uh, within the next six months or a year, TikTok shopping might not be the most hottest trend anymore. It might be something else. So if you don't retrain your model, you're stuck. Number four. Continue to look for bias detection and mitigation. Bias detection is ensure your data is fair. Any data that comes in, right, that is one to one sided without considering another side can actually skew your decision making. Yeah? That's why sometimes you see when, 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 when kids, right, they want something, right, they are so adamant to want something, they, they are very biased towards that something. They won't even consider anything else. 
For example, if a kids like to eat uh, 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 certain noodles, and you want to introduce another type of noodles to to the kid, they are so biased that the other thing that might not look as appetizing is not nice. Right? So we are like that as well. So we got to make sure our data has no biases. We need to consider continue to innovate and experiment. Try new cases, new scenarios where this data can be used, where AI can be used. Don't limit yourself to say, oh, AI can only be used in robotics, in automation. No. It can be used uh, even uh, to understand patterns of changes uh, in, in diseases. You can use it for anything. The only way to, to, to get the value from AI is to experiment what questions are proper questions where results can come out. Right? So we are always experimenting. In fact, uh, when I use ChatGPT, right, or I use uh, some of these AI tools, right, when I ask a question, right, I will always re-ask the question with added information to see what the reply is going to be like. Right? And sometimes I can ask the same question with added information for even more than 10 times. Because every time I look at the answer, right, I will see that, hey, something is missing here. And then I experiment again. What if I add this word? Then you will see different. So again, we need to innovate and experiment how we can use these two tools and expand it. Right, of course, we need to, as, as AI continue to, to, to be part of our organization, we need to also look at how to scale it up. ChatGPT is good, but how do we even scale up the use of ChatGPT where everybody else can use it in the organization? Do we buy licenses for every single user? That's going to be expensive, right? Maybe we must con might consider uh, working with ChatGPT, uh, buying a license, that is more enterprise based, that is more API based, and implement that API or that that the ChatGPT connection or, or software within your internal systems as well, or within your internal knowledge management system that can then leverage both external data and internal data to give you better results. Right? So we need to continually improve. And again, like I say, the word continual means do. Cycles of improvements, do a cycle of improvement, check to see if it's relevant or not before you carry out another cycle. So you know areas where you need to improve. So that brings us to the entire framework of uh, uh, AI adoption, adoption in organizations. So there are six capabilities we're looking at. AI strategy is right in the middle. Right, without the core, without the core strategy, every other capabilities are going to be developed without proper alignment. So your strategies must be there, and then this will support your AI organization, the culture and the roles, your AI architecture, the blueprint, print how your AI will actually going to be carried out or, or or deployed in the environment and managed, your AI technologies, your tools to actually do the AI work, the, the work of cleaning the data, uh, processing the data and things like that. Uh, then you have <coughs> your AI processes, the three main process activities to support AI in terms of development, governance and management, and finally AI continual improvement where you continue to improve. I hope this has been beneficial to you, right? Uh, and I hope this has been helpful to you. Like I said, I know some people say, hey, but Sean, you never said how. Uh, if I would, and, and and unfortunately, with the time given, right, I, I can't always spend to go into the details. That's why what we have done is uh, we have given you uh, some contact uh, information that you can reach out to us and say, Sean, can can we talk further? Right? How How else can we explore this? So we, we can, after that, recommend you to some trainings, uh, to some consultancy work if you want to engage us. Why not? Okay? So before we go on to give you the, the uh, information of how to contact us, so I'm going to open this section for some um, Q&A. Does anyone have any questions that you want to ask? You can put it in the Q&A box, right? 
uh, and then I will try to answer uh, as many as possible. If I can't answer, I we will capture it and then we will provide the answers to you later on. Uh, so anyone has any questions? I'm looking at the chat Q and A box now. Any anyone has anything? Any any questions that you are unclear of? No, too much information. <laughs> okay, maybe 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 I can ask a question. So, how much does all this cost? <laughs> Well, uh, if you're just doing a project uh, and using ChatGPT, that doesn't cost a lot. A lot right? If you're using Gemini, that's about 99 ringgit a month, right? Uh, ChatGPT, I, I don't remember how much, but uh, Gemini, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty familiar with that, yeah? Uh, around there. But again, if you're going to set up this uh, organization, uh, adoption of AI, AI, how much does it cost? It comes down to how much do you want to do, right? And, uh, and I tell people, uh, try not to do everything at once. Start small, right? Start building up your data, start building up your, 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 your uh, some of these uh, strategies first, and then start looking at um, how you want to carry out. Uh, okay, so the question, in terms of learning AI, based on my understanding, it feels like we are training a system to mimic a business-minded individual. Yes, it is. No, no, okay. I won't say that uh, it is just a business-minded individual. It is depending on what you're doing, right? You are training it for specific things. But because uh, technology, a uh, majority of the things decision mimics are very business decision, AI requires to AI is supposed to help businesses solve problems. Of course, let's say you have a technical problem you want to solve, AI can help you with that. Right? But it is not just purely business or technical, it is more holistic to support anybody. So that's why when you ask a question, yeah. Uh, when you ask, oh, how how do I, do I use AI then? Depending on what you are trying to solve, you can do that. There's another question. If I were to delve deeper into AI as a skill, is it sought? Is it a sought after skill in my job market? So again, the question is, uh, what is a job market? What 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 is your job market? You, are you a technical person? Sure, it is, right? In fact, uh, surveys have shown, right? If you, and if you look at LinkedIn or any service, right? AI is one of the most uh, uh, po uh, po not only popular, important jobs moving forward. That's why you notice, right? Nowadays, uh, when kids go to school, they are learning about uh, programming, right? Some kids are also learning about Python, data, and stuff like that. It is going to be very important. And uh, I believe uh, the, the, the same person asked the question actually made this comment saying that uh, AI is the future of Malaysia. You've answered it. It is very sought after, right? Things like uh, big data, data analysis, business analysis, those are very sought after. So it's not, uh, and there's no like, oh, is it more sought after technical or business? They both have their own values. Like for example, for a business person, even though I'm not technical, I need to be able to understand how to use AI to even generate business strategies. So, yeah, it is. So, another question. Uh, what's the comparison between Gemini versus ChatGPT versus Copilot? That's a... <laughs> that is a question, right? I always say that. Hmm, that's a tricky one. Okay. Depending on what you're trying to achieve, each of the tools have different strengths and weaknesses. Like a lot of people now complain that ChatGPT is not detailed enough. And I do tell people, right, that ChatGPT can give a lot of summaries of everything, right? But uh, if you don't pay for it, if you pay uh, ChatGPT, uh, uh, sorry, Gemini Advance, you do get better results, better information. And if Gemini, right, they also provide like drafts 
if you use Gemini, right, you will notice that they give you the answer, but they will also provide you the draft of the different thinking, where how they got to the answer. So you can select even a draft that is more applicable to you, right? Chat GPT, uh, in terms of its usage and the, 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 uh, the adoption, it's much easier because, again, a lot of people, a lot of companies are doing that. Copilot is very Microsoft-centric. And Copilot is good because it actually links to your uh, Outlook, your, your Microsoft Word, your PowerPoint, so that, and, and, and if you're using any Microsoft products uh, or work within the Microsoft environment, Copilot, is powerful to helping you even generate like uh, reply emails, uh, documents, PowerPoints, and stuff like that. So if you ask me, comparison, right, there is no best AI tool to use. It all depends on what you're trying to do. For example, right, you might have heard me talk about perplexity. Some of you might not even have heard of perplexity. But perplexity, right, works better when you want human-like answers and results. Because Gemini and ChatGPT can be, and Copilot can be too business, right? But perplexity actually can be used to actually even provide you answers written in more of a, uh, lang a, a, a common language uh, type of way. So there is no... Uh, best or worst, right? So you got to actually look at that, yeah? So uh, through the comparison copilot, not much helpful. Again, uh, it is very helpful if you're using Microsoft environments. Like like if I'm going to say that, oh, uh, I just got this email from my boss and I want to write it in a way to nicely say no to him. <laughs> in Outlook, copilot works well, okay? Okay, one final question and then I'll pass it back to InfoTrack. Right. Yeah. Perplexity was interesting too. Yeah. One more question. Anybody have questions? While well, I wait for the final question, uh, Jesslyn uh, from InfoTrack has put up the uh, survey for the webinar. If you like uh, the Google link, if you like what we just did, no, I will be like the grab driver. Please give me five stars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you think that uh, I could, uh, that we, we need to do more of these sessions, let us know as well and we see if we can do this or not. Since there are no, uh, any more questions before I pass it to back to Jesslyn? Oh, before we do that, okay, before I pass it to Jesslyn, uh, I want to show you, and I said earlier on uh, some ways to contact us. Okay. So, I always want those who attend workshops like this to be successful. I want you to be successful, to be able to do this. So how can we further help you to be successful? You can contact us via email. Uh, my email is there, uh, Sean Lau, Sean Lau, Sean.lau at mindmagin.com. You can do that. Uh, you can contact directly to my organization, info at mindmagin.com, or you can reach out to InfoTrack, techcenter at infotrack.com. Or if you want, you can add us to LinkedIn and we can actually uh, converse and communicate through there. So my personal LinkedIn is listed there, right? Again, you can take a photo of this or later on when we send you the slides, you can then uh, uh, reach out to us on that. Uh, my Imagine's LinkedIn is also there. InfoTrack's LinkedIn is also there. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. I will now pass it back uh, to Justin. Justin will introduce some other things that is going to link to what we talked about today, which are also very exciting and hope you can join us as well. Justin, back to you. Thank you, Sean. I think this is a very fruitful session for us. Like I see in the comment also, AI also have the framework. <laughs> I thought everyone is talk about the chat GPT or Copilot or those AI tools. But from here, we can uh, let all of you know we didn't sell any of the tools of here, but we, uh, we are giving some framework of uh, how you implement in your organization. So this is where we come from. So don't worry, we won't, we won't uh, ask you to subscribe anything here. It depends on your decision. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you so much uh, for Sean for this one. So I will just share my screen uh, to let you all know that where is the what is the cause that we would like to introduce. Okay, 
So do you see the right screen now? <laughs> I just noticed from my technical team said that um maybe wrongly shared my screen. So I think now it's the correct one. So you can see the poster here. So the course name is AI Power Project Management Workshop. So from here, you can understand about the role of AI in modern project management and also how to apply the AI tools uh, for your task automations and so your risk assessment and also how you enhance the real times that you're using to do the data analysis using the AI tools. Okay, so besides that, uh, if let's say this is the, I mean, because this is the upcoming course that is we are going, will be going to run for the project management team, I think you are, if you are the one that interested to know more about the whole outline, you can just contact us or scan the QR here. So this is my WhatsApp number. I think some of you might receiving my reminder this morning. So you can also reply on top of the message that I sent just now that you would like to have the outline, the full outline of this course. And in other hand, like just now mentioned by Sean also, we are also working on how we help your organization adopt uh, AI wholly in your organization. So the framework like uh, explain actually have a lot of different uh, section that we need to take note on that. So if let's say this session, I mean the workshop webinar today, not giving you a really, uh, how to say, a really clear, how you can start the things. So no worry, you can also let me know. Then we will arrange an expert to talk to you, the free consultation. So it might be Sean uh, or uh, Mikhail or his team. So we will bring them together and to go to your organization. Then we can talk together how to help you on that way. So this is uh, some of the info that I would like you to bring back today. So just quick uh, save this. Uh, I mean, screenshot and save my contact. So anything or any upcoming training, you also can uh, let me know. Okay, so just how we also mentioned that if you like today's session, just feel free to help us to do the Google review, give us a five star or give us some comment so we can improve from there. Okay, so next is, this is a Google review. If let's say you didn't manage to click the link, you can just scan the QR. So while you are filling out the Google review, I would like us to announce that uh, upcoming we are having a agile day conference, Malaysia uh, on 13 of November at Avante Hotel. So this year we have 28 speakers from different industry that we will share about, uh, how to say, uh, lots of the different topics uh, following by four different tracks. So what's the track that we are going to be uh, having on that day is enterprise agility track. And then we also uh, have the design agility track. So if let's say you are from design team, you also can join for that. Then we have operational agility track. Then the last one, we also have technical agility track. So this track, four different tracks will have uh, different uh, focus of the topic from our speaker. So from that, I would like to show this. So this is the some of the details that we will be having for the Agile Day Malaysia. So this is some additional info that upcoming we have this workshop. So you can scan the QR, then go to the landing page and do know more what is this uh, event about. This is our second year doing this event. So hope you can share to relevant team. Okay, so before we end the session today, I would like just to share the video montage for the Agile Day Malaysia. It's just a quick one. I think this morning I did share, but I, I believe some, some of you is coming late, so maybe you might miss out this uh, video. So it's just a quick sharing. Thank you so much. So this is my last slide. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for 
joining us today. And so, so I think I need to conclude this webinar so you can go for lunch. So thank you for attending and hopefully that you have learned and also enjoyed this webinar. So we will see you again in the future training or future webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.